Good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing well. So I wanted to say welcome uh, this to this webinar. Uh, the webinar, and let me get back to where I can see everything good. There we go. All right. So this webinar is titled Overcoming Analysis Paralysis with Inventor NASTRAN. So again, I want to say welcome. I appreciate everybody taking their time out this afternoon to come and join me uh, on this presentation. And hopefully uh, everyone will walk away with a little better understanding of Inventor NASTRAN. Now, Inventor Nastran used to, was formerly known as uh, Nastran NCAD and is a separate install, but actually resides and executes within the Inventor software. Okay. So, now, in this presentation, I want to hit on some of the key factors and key points of the Inventor NASTRAN so that you have really kind of a good understanding. There's no way that I can cover everything in regards to Inventor NASTRAN. Um, there is a two-day class on it. It is really just kind of to get you started in the Inventor NASTRAN side of things. So it's a very complex tool with a lot of different pieces. And so hopefully I'll get you guys a better understanding of some of the core uh, pieces of information in this. So I apologize for the small stalling here. I'm just trying to make sure that everybody gets a chance to get logged in. Uh, for the presentation before I jump into the meat of it. Now, I will say that I'm going to try and keep this presentation portion of this up front as small as I can, uh, but there are some pieces that I would like to just make sure that you get. Uh, so I want to show them to you in here before we actually go out into the software and take a look at a couple of things in there. So to begin with in here, let's talk about kind of our agenda for the day, all right? I'm gonna do an introduction to myself, okay? We're gonna talk about our topic. We're gonna hit on our learning objectives for this course. We're gonna do a presentation, a demonstration, and then we'll talk a little bit about upcoming webinars and I'll open it up for questions. Now, I'm the only person, I'm the only administrator in this, so if you do have questions, there is a questions area that you can put in here. Um, if the question gets too specific, we may have to offline that, but I will gladly stick around as long as I can to answer as many questions as I can uh, on this. So if you have questions as you're going through this, go ahead and put those in the window, the questions window. That way I have uh, that information when I get done and can jump into the Q&A portion of that. So a little bit of information about myself. My background is mechanical design. That's what I've done pretty much all of my adult life. Um, I actually started using AutoCAD in 1984 time frame, I think the release was somewhere around the 2.6, 2.7 AutoCAD, right? A couple of years later, late 84, 85 time frame, I started playing in 3D with a couple of different products um, and was actually a beta tester for Inventor before it was released into the market. And I have actually used every release of Inventor since then. Now, that doesn't mean it's the only software I've used. I've used several other softwares. 
Uh, I'm also trained in SolidWorks. I've used Pro-E. I've used some Katia. Um, even used a little bit of Solid Edge, but just a very little bit. Okay. Uh, and I've also used several products that are no longer on the market. Okay. Things like Mechanical Desktop, Designer, and a couple of other products like that. So it's enough about me. Um, so what is this month's topic? This month's topic is overcoming analysis paralysis. So in the engineering world, we tend to over-design. We want to make sure it's going to be able to handle everything, so we tend to, like I said, over-design it. Okay. Well, sometimes over-designing it doesn't necessarily work. Right. So using a product like Inventor Nastran will help keep that to a minimum. All right. Now, you also want to know in there whether or not something's going to fail. Okay. And if so, where it's going to fail. Again, the Nastran NCAD is intended to do that. All right. And I think I referred to it as Nastran NCAT again, didn't I? All right, it's Inventor Nastran. Sorry. So what are our main objectives here? We're going to talk about some of the different categories of analysis types. So we're going to hit on just kind of some broad different analysis types in here. All right. Then we're going to talk about element types. All right, because analysis types and element types are different. And then we're going to go through a presentation on applying some of those element types within your analysis. So before I go any further, I do want to kind of give a brief overview of an introduction to what FEA and um, Inventor Nastran are. First of all, Inventor Nastran is, again, a separate product that comes with the suite or the group um, that you can download. And it's a separate license, but it actually installs and runs inside of your Inventor software. And it can be used with Inventor files directly or files that I've imported. Now, when I talk about what FEA is, FEA stands for Finite Element Analysis. So what does that really mean? That means that when it gets a model, it wants to break it down into really small pieces so that it can calculate just those small pieces. Well, those small pieces are called elements, okay? Now, those elements are visually defined by the mesh, okay? Now, the mesh also contains what's called nodes, and a node is just a point on that mesh segment, and when I say mesh segment, um, I mean edge, all right? So every edge or every point would have a node on it at the intersection that basically allows it to say that at this point, what is my load at this point? Or what is my stress at this point? Or what is my strain at this point? And then it transfers it from that point down to the next point. And it continues on. And that's how it runs the calculation. Now, all of these tools like this are simulation tools. They're simulating the effect of, of applying information to this. Okay. Now, most people can look at this and probably sit down with a pen and paper if they know enough information 
and run calculations on this to see how much it's either going to deform or yield. Okay, because those calculations are relatively straightforward. Okay, if we know things like the sizes, how it's how it's being controlled, or how it's being constrained, and how it's being loaded. Now, with that, there are three primary what's considered to be element types. Okay, and those element types are solid elements, shell elements, and line elements. And we're going to talk about them really in kind of different categories and different ways of looking at them as we go through this. But these are the element types. And these elements are controlled by what's called the idealization. And so within Nastran, they use these things called idealizations. And basically what I call them is analysis setups. And so since I might have multiple setups on this, then I can have multiple idealizations. And I can decide which idealizations are being applied for this analysis. Okay. Now, in here, the primary focus of this is really going to be some of these element types. Now, part of this, or part of the analysis in here, and I think I mentioned this earlier, is a tool called meshing. And meshing is just the process of breaking it down into those small segments. Well, as we break it down into those small segments in here, those small segments have different degrees of freedom. In other words, different potential movements. So depending on what I'm doing, I'm looking at those degrees of freedom. Now, when you see things like this here, so a solid has three degrees of freedom, translation in the X, Y, and Z. A plate has five degrees of freedom, translation in the X, Y, and Z, and rotation in the X and Y. And then beams have six degrees of freedom. Okay, now, as we build our information, these different elements connecting together takes away degrees of freedom from the one before it. Okay, so it starts tying things together. Now, the biggest key to meshing a component is the size of the mesh. And the way you look at that is called mesh convergence. So mesh convergence is where I'm trying to determine what is my uh, point of diminishing returns on mesh element size. Now, the reason for that is because the more elements I have in there, the more precise my calculation and the more refined my information gets. But at a certain point, the smaller size of the elements can become a hindrance to us. Because the smaller the element, the more the elements, the longer it takes to run the calculation. So mesh convergence allows us to come in and say, all right, when it gets to where that the percentage of change in this is smaller than a certain amount, then I don't want to do it anymore. That's accurate enough. Okay. To kind of show you a visual of that, we'll look at this. 
So as you can see, the mesh is much different between these three different images here. All right, and in here they're looking at von Mies stresses and the different mesh portions of that. All right, so here is, we'll just call it a rough, uh, uh, a rough, a moderate and a fine, okay? So if here over here where I have a rough mesh on that, my von Mises stress is 26 KSI. Well, as I tighten up that mesh and make it smaller, that jumps to 41 KSI. So the difference between these two meshes as far as the um, the von Mies stresses on that is 55%. Okay, now, when I made that mesh, when you go back and make that mesh even finer, then we only grow up to 45 KSI. So we're only gaining 9%. So at some point that starts to flatline and it doesn't change. So therefore we use mesh convergence to say, when is that enough? All right, so now that's just kind of the general information there. All right, now we didn't talk about loads, we didn't talk about constraints, we'll talk about those a little bit as we go through this, but mainly in here, the next thing I want to do is talk about what's called, what I call the analysis categories. And these are the different types of analysis that can be run within the software. So if I break these down, I first of all have what's called linear static analysis. That's primarily where we're going to focus and is probably the most common variation of analysis, okay? Uh, it's used for looking at stresses and strains, deformation, deflection, okay? All of these are basically um, different things that it looks at in there. Now, one other thing about this is it's also looking at what's called small deformation or um, yeah small deformation so it's only considering this that this is only going to give just a little bit and that's a relative term here but it is it's looking for small deformation in this the next top that we look at here is called buckling and buckling is where I'm coming in and looking at a load and I'm looking for failure in here. All right. Now, in there, we're looking at things like critical loads, linear and nonlinear internal stresses. Right. Now, the next top here is called normal modes. Normal modes is where we're looking at things like dampening, frequency and vibration, and noise. Okay. Now, in that, some of the different elements of that are things like natural frequency, mode shape, flexibility and rigid body motion, and modal participation. <coughs> Excuse me. Next, we talk about pre-stress static and pre-stress normal modes. So in this mode, we're enabling um, the ability to analyze 
structural subjects um, to internal stress. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Having some allergy issues this week. Now, next, we have linear steady. <coughs> Excuse me, linear steady state heat transfer. So this is looking at heat and how heat is going to dissipate or transfer through the material. All right. The next one is thermal stress, where we're seeing how that heat applies stress to the part. All right. Now these are all what I what are these all of these are different uh, variations of what we call basic analysis tools. Okay. These are just some of the basic analysis that we can run. Some of the more advanced ones that we can run are things like nonlinear static stress. All right. So here we're not looking at small displacement. We're looking at large displacement. We also have nonlinear heat transfer, or I'm sorry, nonlinear transient heat transfer. All right, so that's where heat's transferring. Um, a lot of times, um, over a period of time, and so it's time dependent. Okay, we also have nonlinear steady state heat transfer. So this is used more for like cooling. Right. We also have random response where we're looking for, like it says there, random responses to um, um yeah, random responses to a dynamic load. All right now, we also have direct and modal frequency responses, where we're looking at how a um, how a frequency affects something. Okay. Now, we also have what's called a shock response spectrum. All right. So, this is used to predict effects of a structure when subject to a shock response. So, here we're talking about things like a seismic event or an impact or an explosion. All right. Now, we also have linear, direct, and modal, and nonlinear transient responses. So these solve for heat with nonlinear thermal boundaries that will actually vary through time. So we're not just looking at applying a heat, but how that heat affects it over time. And then we have uh, what's called the automated impact analysis, basically the drop test, where we're setting up a simulated drop test in there. All right, so these are the advanced analysis capabilities that are in Inventor NASTRAN. Now, let's get in here and talk about some of the different element types 
and go a little bit more in depth into the different element types in here. So the element types in here break down into three different categories. You have linear elements, shell elements, and solid elements. Linear elements are what they call 1D elements. So what we have is you've got points and a line. And along that line, you have a defined profile. Okay, so everything in that is calculated from that profile along that line. A shell element is a 2D element and is considered to be a thin wall element. So in other words, I've got a component, I've got a part here that has thin walls in regards to the overall size. All right. And the last one is solid elements, where we're talking about 3D elements here. All right. And they can come in two different categories. Um, linear and parabolic tetrahedral elements. All right, linear just meaning straight, parabolic meaning they can curve. All right, so a line element, again, really falls into one of three different options, a bar option, a beam option, or a pipe option. All right, so the beam option is the recommended. And so basically what you have is you have a center line profile, you have a center line of this, and at each segment or along that, you have a different profile. And it pulls in those dimensions. All right, a bar element, just exactly that, it's more circular. And then a pipe element is circular but hollow. Now, a line element tends to get applied by default to things that are created in the frame generator. Okay. And when it does that, it also brings over all of the cross-sectional properties from the frame generator or the frame components in there. Now, a shell element, or like I said, a thin wall element, looks at thickness, and you're actually applying a thickness in it. So what it does, basically, is it puts a surface in there, and it runs the analysis off of what I call a mid-plane surface. And then you define the thickness. Now, a basic one is going to have a consistent thickness across all of it. But in the advanced settings, you can actually go in and change the thickness of different segments of that. Now, a solid element requires material properties. and basically is defined based off of the CAD model. Now, a linear tetrahedron or a triangle with depth, okay, or a triangle that comes into a point is gonna have four nodes, all right? Now, the four nodes, one on each corner of the triangle and then one at the point. And so at those points, it would connect with another tetrahedron. Now, a parabolic tetrahedron actually has 10 nodes on it because now you not only have them in the corners, but you have them at the middle of each edge also. 
and they can line up to other parabolic tetrahedrons, okay? So you tend to get a more accurate reading with the parabolic than you do with the linear. But it also depends on really kind of my shapes. If I've got a flat piece without a lot of contour or text or complexity to it, then a linear is going to be fine. But if I've got a lot of complexity to that, it's probably going to go to a parabolic. All right. Like I said, I was going to try to keep that short. So let's go over to the software and talk about some of these different element types here. So I have something that I've created here, and I'm going to kind of try to go in the same type of setup or the same type of concept with a lot of this. So what I've got here is I've just got a basic frame shape here. All right, and in this frame shape, I've used the frame generator, as you can tell. And so when I come in here, the way I set this up is I go over to my environment tab, and in here I have my tool for Nastran NCAD or Inventor Nastran. Obviously, I'm still running 2019, both in Inventor and Nastran. So when I go into Nastran, and this one I've actually already set up, all right, it interprets this and actually comes in and sets each one of these as a beam element. So if you'll notice here, remember I mentioned idealizations. This is kind of my setup, all right? In here, I'm gonna have my different components. And in each one of these components, I'm gonna have my information about that component, all right? So this is a beam element type, or it's a, a, the type is line element, but the line element type is beam. All right. Now, it's a structural member, or I can prop, do property input and input my own parameters for my cross sections. But this is basically telling it to pull it in from um, tube and pipe. I'm sorry, not human pipe, uh, um, frame generator. So from here, again, I have material. And if I go into my material here, I can come in here and look at the general settings for my material. All right. Now, if I wanna change this, then I can come into my material libraries and adjust which material I'm looking at. So if I wanna get specific with my material, I can do that from here. All right, but I'm gonna stay with the, the steel mild here. Now, if you'll notice in my drop down here, I only have steel mild and generic because that's the two materials that were brought over from my file. If I want to change it, I go over here. Now, if I come in and I'll just go ahead and turn off the visibility of this so that you can see the actual elements here. So these are your line elements that it created here. And I've actually already put a load and a constraint on this, but with a load here, all I did was, if I look at this, I came in, I applied a load to this, right? And that load type is a force. The magnitude of it, I've got negative 100 in the FZ. So basically what you do is you look at this triad here, and if you'll notice this is my Z, my Z is pointing that direction. I want my force going the other way. So I use a negative number here. All right, and here I can adjust the size and density of my um, visual representation of my load here. Now my constraint, if I look at that, 
what I'm doing here is I've got different things in here. I've got things like fixed, uh, non-translation, free, and no rotation. All that does is turn on and off check marks in these boxes. All right, what I've done is I've set that edge as fixed so that it does not move. All right, now, once I've done that, I'll come into my mesh setting. I'll look at this, and as you can see, I've adjusted this number down. When we're talking about a line element, all you're really meshing here is that one line. Okay. And here I have an option for linear or parabolic. So I tell it to generate mesh. For this, the mesh doesn't look any different. And then I can run my results. Now, even though I had that result set pretty fine, it runs pretty quickly on there because those are beam elements or line elements, right? So since they're line elements, then they're going to come in and they're going to run pretty quickly. Those are actually, for most people, if you can do it, the preferred method for running an analysis, at least an initial analysis. I could have done that as solids on all of those different pieces, but I probably wouldn't have got any results any different. Okay, now the default thing that it shows you or your default result is a von Mies stress. Again, von Mies stress takes a look at the material and says that the material is going to deform a certain amount before it reaches a point where it will not return. All right, now if you chart that, then you get this line and the rise over run of that line will help you calculate the von Mies stresses. You then take that, compare it to the actual material and make sure that you're not exceeding the materials stress, okay? Now, another thing to look at here, and here's the different really kind of graphs that are in here. I'm going to go to safety factor here. All right. So my minimum safety factor here is 0, 0.000. What does that tell me? It's going to fail. These are fine. This is probably going to fail down here at the end. Let's do this. Okay. So basically, it doesn't think that it can handle that kind of a load. Right. So so this is setting up and running an analysis on a line element. Now, if I come out of here and look at it from a shell element standpoint, then So then in here in my idealization, as you can see here, I have this this component here as a shell element. All right. Now for that shell element, I've set a wall thickness. All right. So if I look at this, I've actually already run mesh, mesh on it. And my mesh is kind of high at the moment or kind of large at the moment. So I'm actually going to run that down. All right. And I'm going to tell it that it can be parabolic. Okay, now it's going to try to interpret this 
But because I have corners here, it's going to go ahead and say it gives me the option for parabolic. I'm going to tell it to generate mesh. And as you can see, my mesh increased there quite a bit. Now, I'm also going to set up on this in here what's called my constraint and my load. So like I said with the constraint here, all I'm doing is I'm defining what is stopping this from moving. All right, so I'm going to look at this as being fixed on this back. Now, let's say that this is bolted in place. All right. In theory, I could use, um, I could tie those holes down just to see how it deforms on those holes. But what if it's welded in place? Okay. So again, this is just different options in here. And you have to interpret how those options affect you and how you're going to apply them. So I look at this, and then I'll come in here and put in a load. So again, my load, I'm just going to set that on this bottom face here. And I'm going to look at my triad here, and I'm going to say, all right, Y is going in that direction, so I'm going to go in the negative of that direction for my force. All right. So if I come in here and say, I'm just going to say five pounds for now, just to see what it does. And I'm going to say, okay. And then I'm going to run my analysis here. All right. So running this analysis tells me where my minimum and my maximum stresses are, and my maximum is going to be in these corners here. It should be pretty even across both corners. So right at that intersection there is where the maximum stress is going to be. So again, I need to go back to my material and look at what the stress allowance is on that. Okay. Now, this is also going to give me an over-exaggerated deflection. So if I come in here to displacement, and turn that on, let it finish loading it, there we go. So this is where I'm getting my maximum displacement, okay? And I can also look at my safety factor here. So my safety factor is still quite low on this, saying that this is not going to be able to handle even five pounds without deforming. Okay, so basically those corners are going to give. I need to give this a little bit more support here. So one of the things I'm going to do here just real quick on this one is I'll finish out of this, and since this is a sheet metal component, I'll come in here to my sheet metal defaults and I'll change that back to 120, therefore changing the thickness of it. Then I'll come back over here to my NAS tray. All right. Now, if you'll notice this has the mesh here, I am going to have to rerun the mesh. So I'm going to tell it to generate the mesh because I have new information there. I've changed it, okay? My loads and constraints really aren't gonna change that much, but now I am gonna come in and run the analysis on this. Hmm. 
Now, as you can see, still my maximum is here in these corners, but again, so let's take a look quickly at displacement. So again, this is going to displace more than because it's out here at the end, all right? And then my safety factor. Now this still says it is not going to be happy with that. So basically, this is still a fail. Um, now, I don't really think it's it truly would fail, but um, again, with the parameters that I've set, this has failed. Okay, I either need to go back and look at the way I've set it up or go back and look at my information. All right, so let's come back out of this real quick. Let's look at one other thing in here. And I think I know why it's failing. This right here, the material. So I'm gonna go to the material and I'm gonna say edit. And as you can see, that left generic material. Yep, that's why it failed because there is no Von Mies stresses in that. And so I'm going to come in here and select material. And I'm just going to go 6061 aluminum on this. So now, basically, what I've done is I've now gone in and changed my idealization. All right of this. So again, if I run this again now, and originally creating it, I'd probably used stainless. Now, the loads are not necessarily that much different, okay, because this is talking about a load, not really a comparison to anything else. Okay. Now my displacement, my displacement did change because aluminum is a little bit more flexible. But let's see what my safety factor is now. Now, as you can see, my safety factor is way up there. Okay. The biggest concern back here is the contact surface of where that's meeting up. That's the only place it says it could possibly fail. This is going to handle that load now. Okay, so again, you have to look at either how you set it up or what you're actual looking for on this. Now, let's go to one more, which is gonna be a solid here. And I know it's similar type part to what we looked at just now, but we're going to run this as a solid here, okay? So when we come over to the environment, we're going to go into the Nastran NCAD environment here, and this is set at carbon steel. I do need to update my mesh, so um, I'm going to go to my mesh settings real quick. I have this set pretty fine. And the element type is parabolic here. And so I'll go ahead and have it regenerate the mesh because I made some changes to the model. All right. And I do need to put a load and a constraint on this. So my constraint on this, I'm going to put as this bottom face here. All right. Now, Normally it, that would have probably been bolted down, but I'm gonna put that as the bottom face. And then my load is going to be applied to this face. But now looking at my triad, that's going in the X direction and that's what I want. I want this load going in the X direction and I'm gonna go 100 pounds.
and I'm going to run my analysis. So as you can see, the processes are similar, okay? It's just the different element types create different mesh settings in this and really do create really kind of different results for this. Now, again, when you see the visuals of these, a lot of times it gives an over-exaggerated visual on this, right? But again, here's we have the, the Von Mies stresses on here. I can also look at displacement on this. All right. So this is saying 1.704 e to the negative 03. So in other words, it's stressing quite a small amount. Or I'm sorry, displacing quite a small amount. And the safety factor on this, uh, the minimum safety factor is 10. So it could handle, in theory, 10 times that load or 1,000 pounds and still make it. So you've got to be careful about looking at the color and automatically judging it as since it's red, it's got an issue. A safety factor higher than one means you've not, you're not going to fail. Okay. Now, again, you could, in theory, come in here. And I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say that I'm going to cut this down to a basic one. And I could come back and run this without that rib in the middle off of that same part. Okay. So um, i got about a few minutes left. So I wanted to go back in here. That finishes the demonstration. We do have some more events planned and being worked out. Uh, I highly recommend that you go to the um, event schedule in on the site and look for uh, the next events. Uh, I do not have access to that information at the moment. Um, our year changes over July 1st, and so all that stuff will roll out really quickly at that point as to what the next one is. Now, if you're interested in taking a class on this, you can go to the ASI Design Software uh, slash courses and look for NASTRAN NCAD. I think it's still under that, um, but we'll change over to Inventor NASTRAN. So if you do not, if you do have questions and you would prefer to do it offline, my email address is rsavage at rand.com. All right. Uh, I would welcome any emails with questions, uh, any emails with uh, comments or criticisms or anything like that. Please send them to me. Uh, I want to make sure that I grow and get better next time at doing presentations. All right. So that's the end of the actual presentation portion of this. And I open this thing and there's no questions in there, at least none that I see. Let's make sure. So either I did a really good job explaining things or I got you so confused that you don't know where to start. Either way. All right. So again, if you have a question, uh, you can definitely put that down in the questions area. There's also a chat area if you would prefer to use that. All right. I'm going to stick around as long as I need to answer any questions that you may have. Um, let's see. One of them just popped up. Analyzing welds. So analyzing welds. Hold on just a second. Let me. There we go. So a couple of questions have popped up. Um, yes, this webinar is being recorded. Um, if you'll check back with the site, they will post that uh, on the site. Now, uh, the other question is, uh, how would you recommend analyzing a weld? 
Well, there's a couple of different factors in there when we talk about welds. One is the weld material. Um, so you actually have to kind of set up a separate, the, the specific weld material. Uh, and you can do that um, through the system. Um, now that might get a little more complicated. Um, if you would email me with a little bit more detail as to what you're kind of trying to weld um, and how you've got it set up. Are you talking about a full structural frame or are you talking about just two pieces welded together? Um, because if it's just two pieces welded together, a lot of times I'll treat that as a single part. All right, as long as I know my weld is a quality weld, okay, and the weld and the person doing the weld is doing it accurately, then a lot of times I can consider it a solid piece because the part's going to break at the material before it's going to break at the weld. Now, that's not always true, but that's just kind of the general theory on that. So another one uh, has popped up. Uh, does the stress analysis and inventor have the option to do parabolic mesh? No. No, the basic stress analysis in Inventor is um, just linear mesh. Yes. Uh, can we have a vibration and seismic analysis webinar? Um, I will definitely put that on the list um, and see when I can get that put in there for you. Uh, I'll actually make a note of that here in just a second. So the stress analysis tools inside of Inventor versus NASTRAN tools. First of all, NASTRAN is going to take it a lot further and give you a lot more detail and a lot more complexity, even to the extent that um, in NASTRAN, you've got a lot more analysis options. Um, first of all, um, the inventor analysis does not do vibration. It does not do thermal. Um, it does not do nonlinear materials. Okay, so again, you're talking about a degree of complexity. Does that help? So any other questions? Yes, you can do, do composites in here. Uh, you can actually build the composites and there's a tool in there for building a, a composite material where you've got different material types and you're basically stitching those together. You actually control how they're stitched together. So you actually have to build the composite material. So um, the last thing that popped up is, uh, or the next thing that popped up is, at what point should you switch from a linear to a nonlinear analysis uh, to account for large deflection? Um, Part of that depends on material. Um, if I'm running a nonlinear material and I'm getting large deflection, then I'm kind of getting failure. But if I'm running a, um, a nonlinear material and I'm getting large deflection, then I need to switch over I need to be running it as a nonlinear analysis. You know, that's a good question. Um, so another question came up or a follow-up about um, composite. 
uh, and the question was based around doing reinforced concrete. Um, I think that would actually have to be modeled in there. Uh, I don't think you're going to do that with a material. You're actually going to do something like that with um, a modeling process. Okay, and you're basically going to model an assembly and one of the components is going to be the rebar and the other one's going to be the, the information around it. Now, you kind of got to be careful when you do that because obviously you've got contact there um, and how do you account for that, you know. Um, but that is a very good question. I've actually seen that done before with by assembling that. Okay. Um, there was a short point about mesh convergence. Um, no, this it's it's not a it's not always a manual process. Um, you can actually set mesh convergence to basically it'll look at it multiple times and look for a point of diminishing returns. And you can define where that diminishing returns is with the mesh convergence settings. Uh, so somebody posted, would like to see multiple components set up webinar. Uh, for example, reinforcement, um, interaction, uh, capture, captured inside the different material types. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. So if I come back in here and I'm not going to do that yet, I'm going to go over here. So if I go into my mesh settings and then come in here to this here, this is the mesh convergence settings, okay? Um, I have my refinement, my growth rate, my angle, and my tolerance here. see. Oops, sorry, hit the wrong button there. Now, also, if I have multiple components, just as kind of a side note, if I have multiple components in here, I can use what's called a mesh table and set the mesh size based on the component in there. Now, I also have a mesh control here, but this is not mesh convergence. This is just mesh control where I can come in and refine mesh in a certain area. Let's see. Now, if you'll notice here, this is actually doing a mesh convergence in the analysis. So there's actually one kind of built into it. Um, and this actually ran the calculation 68 times and the final mesh convergence was a very small number. Um, so in here is where you would look at kind of your element information. And in the class, we go through a lot of the different element uh, setups and how to look at your mesh and uh, know if your mesh is a good mesh. 
and things like that. So there's a lot of that that we do in the class. All right, so does that help? Yeah, um, setting your mesh convergence is really, it's different than it used to be. Um, a lot of it is done here in the settings. Um, let's see. I'll tell you what, send me an email and I'll send you um, really kind of the documentation on that. Yes, Sim Mechanical had a mesh convergence tool where you set in there your percentage uh, or your size variation. Um, Nastra in here is doing this kind of automatically. because I've used Sim Mechanical also. All right. Well, if you're quite welcome. Um, if nobody has any more questions, um, I'm gonna let you guys get back to work. Um, Again, if you have any questions or comments for me, uh, by all means, send me an email. Uh, it's rsavage at rand.com. I know. Oops. No. So if anybody needs my help, let me know. Other than that, hope you all have a great day. And hopefully I'll talk to you in a class somewhere down the line.